Hello, salam everyone. Very, very warm welcome to Visual Arts uh, in and on Afghanistan, political violence, war, and the question of futurity. It is my immense pleasure to welcome our audience to this hybrid event today. A warm welcome and thank you to everyone joining us online or in person here at Duke University in Durham, North Carolina. I would like to extend deep gratitude to the Department for Gender, Sexuality, and Feminist Studies and our chair, Professor Jennifer Nash, for the generous support that made this event possible. I would also like to thank the wonderful departmental co-sponsors for their support of this event, including the John Hope Franklin Humanities Institute, Cultural Anthropology, the Department for Art, Art History and Visual Studies, and Asian and Middle Eastern Studies at Duke University. A warm thank you goes to the graphic artist Nigar Yazdan Pano for transforming a photo and an idea into a beautiful piece of graphic art, and Shafaq Rahimi for joining us today as a translator. To our departmental staff, Anand Pratap Singh, Julie Winmore, Jeremy Boomhauer, and Amanda Archambault, many thanks for pulling everything together. A special thank you to Professor Francis Hasso and Professor Anna Krilova for running this year's theme year on feminist theory and imperialism. Last but not least, I like to thank the panelists, Dr. Anila Daulatzai, Professor Shah Mahmoud Hanifi, Sadi Abatul, Mohsen Tasha, and Shamoyel Shalizi for sharing their knowledge and time with us today across about four time zones. Before I introduce our trailblazing panelists to you and prior to entering the panel discussion, allow me to contextualize the theme of the event today. This event is in many ways the result of the ongoing processing of deep grief, anxiety, utter frustration, and profound anger through camaraderie, friendship, and deeply valuable mentorship, as well as by way of playing, drawing, dancing, and learning with children, such as the little boy on the event poster, who is by now a teenager, and who resides in the window of hope in Kabul, an orphanage for children with disabilities run by the Enabled Children Initiative. Okay. The question of futurity links subjectivities in Afghanistan as a site of occupation intimately with North America, a site of settler colonialism. I acknowledge that we're meeting here today on the stolen land of several indigenous nations, including the Tutelo and Saponi speaking peoples. Many indigenous nations in North Carolina have been eradicated by way of political violence of genocidal magnitude. They were killed in war, by diseases, and the colonizing project of European settlers. While I cannot do justice here to, today to the generations of knowledge production on healing, ecological knowledge, and practices to commemorate the dead, I would like to acknowledge its relevance, the relevance of indigenous studies as we think about the question of futurity in Asia and Africa. Considering the past and present of Afghanistan, the question of futurity as deployed here today explores potentialities and possibilities for social and political life, organized from the bottom up, while colonialism, imperialism, and national elitism proliferate social, political, and economic, as well as ideological structures that engrave grief, loss, and suffering into people's ways of knowing, living, working, and dying. The invasion and occupation of Afghanistan has been framed dominantly by governments and organizations of capitalist democracies as well as the new bourgeoisie that emerged with the US dollars floating into the country and among the old Afghan political elite in the country and diaspora as an act of friendship, a key partnership or an alliance built through multilateralism. As we inquire today possibilities and potentialities for futurity, we think against responses to future vis visions of life, creativity, health and labor in Afghanistan as defined by capitalist democracies. What kind of epistemological, political, and social possibilities arise when we comparatively think from the vantage point of Afghanistan, Palestine, and Haiti as sites of military intervention and laboratories of neoliberal capitalism? How can political, economic, and ideological blueprints of capitalist democracies that claim that political liberalization with the new bargain with capitalism, to quote a term by feminist geographer Jennifer Flurry, 
be unlearned? What becomes possible when subjectivities refuse to be treated like disposable objects, not only by post-colonial security states, but also capitalist democracies and its allies that promise that liberation can only be found by way of liberal war and so-called liberal peace? How can we interrogate the ways in which liberalism, neoconservatism, and militarism entrench cultural production in and on Afghanistan, as well as in Iran, without anti-imperialist critique being connoted with pro-Hezbollah and pro-Taliban politics? We might not find answers to these questions today, but to challenge neoliberal blueprints for the future by capitalist democracies and in post-colonial states, these questions are salient. The art labor process and artworks produced in the war mode of neoliberal capitalism in the recent past and present in Afghanistan can, can inhabit the potentiality for imagining social transformation and political reorganizing, not suddenly, not artificially, definitely not from top down, but over time. As Franz Fanon reminds us in The Wretch of the, of the Earth, most often decolonization is characterized by the substitution of one system of oppression by another, because there is no time to rethink and reimagine social and political relations. Envisioning futurity outside of the neoliberal paradigm and in conversation with other revolutionary re liberation movements will not serve us immediate solutions. I won't be able to do justice to the manifold and multiple manifestations of uh, art spaces and embodied knowledges across Lahore, Kabul, Tehran, Mashhad, Islamabad. Here, however, I hope that we can proliferate radical pathways to in uh, investigate. In the course of the 20th and 21st century, Black and Palestinian artists have imagined potentialities for different futures through varieties of mediums. Palestinian artists have expressed through film, literature, poetry, and visual artwork the difficulty to envision a future that is not defined by daily spatial manifestations of the military occupation of Israel and the embodied experience of settler colonial governance. Afrofuturists investigate through speculative fiction in literature, poetry, visual art, music, and science fiction potentialities for Black life and liberation. Their creations and writing complicate and complement the constructions of Black life as intrinsically tied to social and physical death, as examined by Orlando Patterson in the early 1980s in his analysis of enslavement of Black people and race relations in North America. In a webinar from June 2021 entitled Decolonial Futures, Palestine in and the Global South, hosted by the Institute of African Studies at the University of Ghana and with Rana Barakat from Birzeit University in Palestine, Faisal Garba highlights how the colonial present of South Africa and Palestine in the era of decolonization in the 1950s and 1960s were central to the, I quote, imaginary of total decolonization, end of quote, from the vantage point of Ghana. The productivity of this comparative analysis also becomes salient in Buried in Red Dirt, Race, Reproduction, and Death in Modern Palestine, mm -hmm. published in 2022. Here, Francis Hasso explores in one chapter Palestinian reproductive and anti-reproductive desires and practices and manifestations of futurity since 1948 through Palestinian poetry, fiction, and film. Taking recourse to African diasporic and Black feminist and queer research, the Palestinian po prose, poetry, and films Hasso examines convey pessimistic futurities in the face of social, political, and biological death, quote, as life and struggle go on, end of quote, under military occupation. Artwork is not necessarily an expression of revolutionary ideas emerging from the bottom up, and it does neither naturally inhabit the potentiality to imagine different modalities of subjectivity and alliance building for the occupied. In contrast, artwork can be deployed as a productive tool that resonates with the political ideology of its donors, example given governments, institutions, organizations, and foundations. The sensationalization of women practicing art, example given 
in the center contemporary art Afghanistan from the early 2000s until about 2014 when the center was closed did render unintelligible to global audiences the competition that neoliberal development had also engendered in the field of visual arts. Visual arts, particularly contemporary and street art projects, and women as target beneficiaries became another site of capitalist economic development. The future visions that were on the table were those of NATO member states, as well as the nominally sovereign government of Afghanistan. The neoliberal logic promoted the idea that subjects of occupation would own the process of capitalist defined economic development, as well as political and military reconstruction. This is also a key element of counterinsurgency doctrines of the US military and intelligence, as well as in NATO member states. Capitalist democracies proliferated the idea that futurity would lie in sustainable development, good governance, private sector growth, and the multilateral organizing of social, economic, and political relations. In the war mode of neoliberal capitalism, gender and visual arts became embedded in political arenas to showcase cultural production and to humanize the war of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization in Afghanistan. Scholarship in queer studies, examining manifestations of bio and negro politics, reminds us to cite Simo Shahsori that, I quote, the representability of some queer deaths and unspeakability of others complicate biopolitics and necropolitics, pointing to the killability of lives that are simultaneously imbued with and stripped of liberal universal rights, lives that are subjected to the politics of rightful killing, end of quote. During the so-called war on terror in Afghanistan, Capitalist democracy's investments in visual culture promoted particular genres and pedagogies of art as authoritative, authoritative and relevant in the reconstruction of the nation state, while others were treated like remnants of a past with less of a value for the future of the country. During my doctoral field work, I began to unlearn the ways in which cultural production was narrated in scholarship and in digital spaces. I began to gather empirical data since 2015 in Afghanistan, Iran, and Pakistan. The data on Afghanistan turned with the end of NATO's Afghanistan war into oral archives of time witnesses, documenting their situated accounts of art education, pedagogies, exchanges, exhibitions, and practices since the 1970s in Kabul and during migratory cycles that were for most spent in Iran and or Pakistan, but also depending on the era in the Soviet Union, in India, or the Gulf. War and political violence has amidst death, injury, incarceration, destruction, migration, and displacement in other words, social and political death in Afghanistan interfaced with eclectic and multiple oral and visual archives of artwork, artistic pedagogies, practices and mediums. The analysis of oral and visual archives of these oral and visual archives during the Soviet occupation and war from 1979 to 1989, the civil war years from 1989 to 1992, and then from 1992 to 1996, as well as the Taliban government from 1996 to 2001, and the NATO occupation and war from 2001 to 2021, and following the formal takeover of the Taliban post-2021, invites to dismantle the ways in which ideologies and imperial circuits of knowledge and capital hegemonically narrate the recent past and present of gender roles and relations, and visual arts in Afghanistan. As a result of the pushback of women into domestic places due to the civil war and subsequently the 1990s Taliban government, men dominated fine arts and Islamic arts education practice and pedagogies as instructors, practitioners, and students in higher education, private run art studios, national institutes, and formalized and inform, uh, informal formations, social formations. To understand male subjectivities, choosing visual arts as income and or knowledge generating labor during war, I took the multiple coexisting artistic modernities in Afghanistan serious. I interviewed male artists working with the classical tradition of landscape painting, rural naturalism and realism, Islamic calligraphy, contemporary Islamic calligraphy, contemporary miniature painting, and contemporary and conceptual arts, and put their work 
the, the Euro European and Anglo-American tradition and put their work in conversation with the spatial and thematic work of the few female artists active in arts in Kabul, as well as in Tehran and Lahore post-2001. So to conclude, considering the past and present of technologies of political violence and infrastructures of war deployed against people from Afghanistan, Palestine, Haiti, and to Turtle Island, an indigenous term for North America, a guiding question we ask today is, how could a different modality of subjectivity and alliance building in Afghanistan and transnationally look like in which human life, non-human life, and the environment do not compete to be valued? How do political, economic, social, and epistemological impediments to envisioning an anti-imperialist future in Afghanistan manifest themselves? In what ways has political violence and war and its implications for subject formation and knowledge production in Afghanistan been researched? And how do visual artists, by way of archival analytic and analytical labor, visually investigate life, labor, and death facing political violence and manifestations of war in daily life. Without further ado, allow me to introduce our wonderful panelists. Dr. Anila Daulatzai from the Department of Anthropology at UC Berkeley is a political and medical anthropologist affiliated with both UC Berkeley and US Santa Cruz. She has taught in prisons and in universities across three continents. She has been conducting research in Afghanistan as well as with Afghan refugees in Pakistan for almost three decades. Between 2006 and 2013, she carried out ethnographic fieldwork in Kabul and taught at Kabul University and at the American University of Afghanistan. Her past and current research projects look at widowhood, heroin use, and polio through the lens of serial war in Afghanistan. She has published articles in Jadalia, Al Jazeera, and several academic journals, and is a contributing member to Brown University's Cost of War Project since 2014. She is currently completing her book manuscript, provisionally titled War and What Remains, Everyday Life in Contemporary Kabul, Afghanistan. Professor Shah Mahmoud Hanifi, professor of history at James Madison University, is, is housed at James Madison University where he teaches courses on the Middle East and South Asia. Hanifi received a BA from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and a PhD from the University of Michigan. His dissertation formed the basis of a Gutenberg E Prize from the American Historical Association that resulted in his first book, Connecting Histories in Afghanistan. Hanifi's research and publications have addressed subjects including colonial, political economy, the history of printing, the Pashto language, photography, cartography, animal and environmental studies, and Orientalism in Afghanistan. His recent edited book focuses on the early 19th uh, century British Indian scholar administrator Mount Stuart Elphinstone, and he is now working on a monograph that examines the environmental history of Afghanistan over the long durée through water, wood, animals, and food. Hanifi served as the treasurer of the American Institute of Afghanistan Studies from 2003 to 2015, and from 2017 to 2020, he served on the South Asia Council of the Association for Asian Studies and on the Board of Trustees of the American Institute of Indian Studies. He now serves on the editorial board of the journal Afghanistan and as a special theme editor on Afghanistan for the Oxford Research Encyclopedia of Asian History. In addition to the AHA, Professor Hanifi has received research grants from the Social Science Research Council, the Council of American Overseas Research Centers, the Asian Development Bank, and the Carnegie Corporation of New York. Sadia Batul is a visual artist. She was born in 1998 in Quetta, Pakistan. She completed high school in Quetta and received for her Bachelor of Fine Arts a merit based scholarship at the prestigious National College of Art in Lahore in 2019, where her major was in painting. Her practice of art is through different mediums, including sculpture, printmaking, collage practice, and the study of Mughal, Persian, miniature painting, as well as oil painting. Sadia has exhibited her work in the Young Artists Exhibition at Alhamra, Lahore in 2019 and 2020. Mohsen Tasha, also a visual artist, is now 
based in France and was born in 1991 in Kabul. He received a secondary school diploma from the Fine Arts Institutes in Kabul, a high school offering specialized training in fine arts. In 2017, Mohsen received his Bachelor of Fine Arts from Beacon House National University in Lahore, Pakistan, where he majored in visual arts. At the moment, he is an artist in residence at the Villa Villa Arson National School of Fine Arts in Nice, France. Mohsen first exhibited his artworks internationally in 2010 and has since then participated in many exhibitions, including amongst others, Documenta 13, Castle Kabul in Germany, uh, the 56th Venice Biennale, Nord Art in 2018 in Germany, Khar Mohre, Art Under Fire in Afghanistan, exhibited in Marseille, France in 2019, and the other Kabul Remains of the Garden at the Kunstmuseum Thun in Switzerland in 2022. And last but not least, I would like to introduce to you the multi multimedia artist Shamoil Shalizi, who grew up between Russia, the US, and Afghanistan. Shamayel holds a Master in Social Anthropology from SOAS, the School of Oriental and African Studies, University of London. She is the founder and designer of Blingistan, a jewelry and apparel, apparel line with a strong emphasis on politics and activism. She paints, photographs, and writes poetry about identity, being an Afghan woman, war, and homecoming. Shamoil published her first poetry collection, Shut Up, Chup Show, and I do not know the Russian version of this, and I can't write Cyrillic, unfortunately, but Shamoil will surely tell you, in 2022. She is a co-host on Diaspora Passing, a weekly podcast that tries to bridge the gap between Afghanistan and her diaspora. Currently, Shamoil is in Berlin, but hopes any day to return home to Kabul Bakhair, as she said. Shafak Rahimi, who is translating from Dari Farsi to English today, was born in Kabul. After graduate, graduating from the, law and, from the Law and Political Science School of Herat University in 2012, he began his career as a legal advisor for the Justice Sector Support Program, a rule uh, of law program funded by the U.S. State Department. Since 2014, Shafak has been a translator for several organizations, including Human Rights Watch. His interest in justice and human rights led him to pursue a master's degree at, uh, in transitional justice, human rights, and the rule of law at the Geneva Academy of International Humanitarian Law and Human Rights. In August 2022, he completed his studies and his master's paper examining the atrocities against the Hazara people in the context of genocide. After the Taliban takeover in 2021, Shafak relocated to Ireland. Here he has been working with the law firm Adelshaw Goddard and has been actively pursuing his goal of becoming a lawyer in Ireland. Now, to set off the conversation, I'd like to start by thinking together about tracing the logics of colonial and liberal archives and ways of knowing Afghanistan. Professor Hanifi, in what ways have colonial and later liberal archives delineated the epistemological foundations of understanding and documenting life, labor, and death in the political economy of Afghanistan since the 18th century? Well, uh, Panis, thank you very much for that important and provocative question. And thank you very much for organizing and every all the supporters uh, who helped you get this together at Duke. It's a pleasure to be here with you and to be with a number of uh, really impressive uh, artists and academics here. Um, so thank you very much. Um, let me, again, by way of prefatory remarks, just say how important and how much I applaud uh, your placing Afghanistan in conversation with the African-American experience in Palestine through the concept of futurity. I, I find that really valuable. I, I find there to be too little uh, comparative and theoretical um, political, progressive political work on Afghanistan. And again, uh, standing applause from my sitting position here. Um, I, th I think it's also Im important to um, note how significant it is that this is being held at Duke, which as an institution has an important role in knowledge production about Afghanistan. It's kind of a subject of our concerns today. And I'd like to return to that uh, as we proceed. Um, and, you know, uh, I imagine I'm here to address sort of the textual 
basis of visual cultural production. Um, but I would like to impose a few visuals of my own. And so for that purpose, I'll try to share my screen now. Um, and I'll mainly be using maps here, which are a really kind of key. Uh, I hope my screen is visible. You can just let me know. Um, thank you. Um, maps are a key, you know, artifact of knowledge. They combine all kinds of knowledge and are really a tool of power. And um, this is a collage of images produced by the Royal Society of Arts. And I uh, think it's, it's interesting, but I would like us to imagine, really, if we were to populate this outline of a map of Afghanistan with a word cloud, what would be the sort of textual basis of, the, of this imagery? I challenge the audience to help me uh, think through that, all right? Um, Again, I've argued before, I think it's important to restate that in my view, um, the knowledge produced about Afghanistan has been used against the people of Afghanistan in fundamental ways that are really problematic and need to be addressed and unpacked. And um, I'd like to do so by sort of using the lens of empire, which you've so helpfully set up. And really it's a critique of empire. In, in my thinking, it's inextricably uh, the case that capitalism as a historic formation is bound up with colonialism and empire. And of course, uh, the neoliberal phase of global capitalism um, uh, is what we're here to address, I think. Um, and finally, really, as far as archives are concerned, to answer your question now, specifically, Panis, I think the archives are um, quite um, varied with multiple forms of data. Um, they're, they're, they're vast. I think there's more information about Afghanistan and global archives and there is in Afghanistan exponentially. These archives are largely unexplored. These archives um, contain information that's full of, full of contradictions in its own terms um, and, and full of a lot of contestation. Um, if we read the archives critically, and I think we need to do more of that. Um, and so uh, let me see if I can proceed. Uh, the colonial archive of Afghanistan begins with Mount Stuart Elphinstone in really substance with his book, An Account of the Kingdom of Kabul in 1815. And this is the map contained in that book. And so I think the first thing to note um, about what, how the archives structure the epistemology of Afghanistan um, is geographically. And of course, the original focus is on the kingdom of Kabul. Afghanistan is not visible on this map. And so what's important to note about the archives is that they are the context in which Afghanistan emerges um, out of the kingdom of Kabul, so to speak. And so um, the name itself, is one example of a larger discursive formation that takes shape that's inherited through the archives. And this um, involves most clearly the map itself that emerges through colonialism, but also the um, sort of uh, kind of epistemological invasion of focusing on Kabul to the exclusion of other urban zones and the rural zone is rendered invisible uh, in this. Um, I think the map is also um, one that ultimately takes shape and impedes mobility. The historic reality of this space is of constant multi-directional flows of people to, through, from, um, and within. And the modern map of Afghanistan that takes shape is really an impediment to mobility and colonialism has a, you know, wants to freeze mobility. Uh, in so many ways, neo-colonialism as well. I think that's important, the mobility restrictions associated with the map. And so, you know, in all of this naming and framing, this is discursive control. Um, it relies a lot on censorship and propaganda in the colonial era, uh, lies and distortion, to be clear, um, orientalism, racism, a lot of partial truths. And, um, this is, again, a part of the discursive formation that we're dealing with here. Um, along with other, uh, let's say, 
forms of knowledge and sciences beyond cartography and geography. It, it, history, the, the colonial importance uh, for Elphinstone and the colonial archive more generally is to position Kabul as the center of this polity that becomes Afghanistan, but positioning Pashtuns at the historic and political cultural core of the entity in question. And this framing um, is one that takes shape through historical linguistics and the discipline of history is really important here. Um, language sciences are important here, but colonialism works through control and it's about establishing majority and minority relations. Majority and minority relations, I'll repeat that. And the framing of Afghanistan as a Pashtun dominated one takes shape through a lot of demographic sciences. There's a sense also that takes shape in the early map of the tribal constitution of Afghanistan being internally organically fractious. And so the failed state model, that's the modern version of colonial um, framings take shape. The idea that Pashtuns dominate this thing that's failed is a really contradictory aspect of the discursive formation of Afghanistan. And um, in all of the sciences that are employed, whether it's anthropology or linguistics or history, there's expertise that takes shape these experts that speak on Afghanistan are non-Afghans for the most part. They are generally reliant upon translators and interpreters and don't have a lot of local knowledge, but their expertise carries a lot of social and political capital in the context of empire. And so the development of expertise and career building and profiteering on the space of Afghanistan by imperial and colonial actors needs to be noted. It's in the archives. Um, I would say that the um, experimentation politically, socially, militarily that takes shape in the colonial era, neo-colonial uh, actions in Afghanistan is worth noting. And the increasing forms of violence and the unaccountability for the increasing forms of violence is another aspect of the a colonial archive. Um, and as we proceed to the late 19th century, when the borders of Afghanistan take shape and the ruler Abdur Rahman is positioned as the Amir of Kabul, very much like a princely state in, uh, in British India, um, we see the real uh, internalization of colonial paraphernalia, the star uh, Abdurrahman's uniform here, I think the photographic archive needs attention and needs to be deconstructed more thoroughly when it comes to Afghanistan. But if this is the ruler of Afghanistan, it's full of kind of colonial instrumentality. The, he titles himself the Knight Grand Commander of the Star of India, which is this star here. And in his documentary production, he signs his name. Amir Abdurrahman, you can see in very poor handwriting here, with the same acronyms, KGCSI, of, an, of a colonial title. So I would like to um, kind of put pho photographs and uh, the individuals that uh, are the rulers of Afghanistan into more of a critical framework. Finally, just end some comments. In terms of labor, Afghanistan is an agricultural uh, preponderantly agricultural zone of production. Historically, Afghanistan has fed itself, exported food. And I want to know where our food went. Through what agencies did our food disappear that we become a food importer? Where everyone in any university town around the world can find pilau and kebab, Afghan versions of it throughout London, for example. But in Afghanistan, our, our, our food scarcity and famine uh, take shape through the collusion of imperial forces and our local rulers as Afghans. And we can pick up on this uh, further down the road. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Hanifi, uh, for, for laying the foundations of the archive in such an insightful and valuable way. And there are so many things to think about and process and put into conversation. Um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Daulatzai. Now, 
moving into the 20th and 21st century, how does liberal ideology begin to circulate in the 20th and 21st century in Afghanistan? And how has liberal ideology during the US-led NATO war in Afghanistan shaped ways of knowing in the country? Thank you so much, um, Penny, John, and Duke and everyone. I am going to take a, a few minutes just to, to comment. Um, um, and thank the organizers, Penny's John. Um, thanks for everything you've done because I know it's it's um, it's a labor of love that 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 uh, pulled this together, and all the people at Duke, um, uh, Professor Hasso, and so many others that have supported you in doing this. So you know, bravo to to Duke to taking the care um, to to do this um, at a time when the world has again turned away from Afghanistan. Um, Second, um, I will have to comment, and maybe this is just putting too many of my all my cards on the table, but I don't mind because I think my um, my existing work in general is pretty clear on on my positions on Afghanistan. But this is um, this is the, the probably the most um, stunning intro um, and panel um, on Afghanistan that I've participated in um, in twenty years plus. Right, so um, I, I I echo um, the um, the applause from Professor Hanifi about the 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 link to uh, futurism, looking at Palestine, um, other anti-imperial spaces, um, um, you know, Afrofuturism. I just I, I applaud everything that you brought together, uh, Penny's John, and as I said, um, I. Um, I can't commend you and those who have supported you enough in um, in uh, making such a, a stunning, um, yeah, commentary. Like, yeah. So that goes without saying. Now, in terms of, um, I'll keep my comments very uh, limited because I do want to stick um, as much as I can to the time. But um, also just to lay a few uh, comments out. But I, I really want to um, save as much time for. Um, the artists um, and the engagement with with all of us, right? Um, so we could just sort of get free flowing of ideas and whatnot. I will say um, when you when you um, ask about the question of um, liberalism and the liberal position, right? I want to complicate it, and, and I'll start it from from the withdrawal, right? Because it is the most um, um, recent thing in collective memory of people, and um, and how the withdrawal uh, of um, troops and everything from Afghanistan occurred, right? Um, the classic uh, liberal position was um, to be shocked and horrified and to critique the withdrawal. We're like, oh my God, it was like horrible and, you know, and, and comment on um, how messy it was and it could have been better. And the, the you know, the, the, the final drone attack um, it, I mean, obviously not final, but it, it, that coincided, you know, the, the drone attack in, in Kabul um, that that killed um, innocent aid worker and his family, right? Um, th that just the withdrawal was messy, just the withdrawal was unorganized, ignoring the fact that the whole 20 years of war and occupation was as or more messy. Right, so the classic liberal position was just to critique the withdrawal, but not the war, and really not the invasion, right? And it was stunning to me that that even scholars on the left, and not scholars of Afghanistan, but scholars um, that are trying to do that work of like linking um, anti-imperial struggles across the world, they themselves suddenly found themselves writing about a critique of the invasion of, of, of Afghanistan 20 years late, right? So I'm starting with the withdrawal just to sort of illustrate what the literal the liberal position has looked like, right? Over the past 20 years, me um, as a researcher and teacher in Afghanistan, right? During a US occupation, um, what it looked like was um, war was just in the background, sort of the natural landscape of a place like Afghanistan, not just like there's trees, there's the sky, there's Anad, there's war, right? Not the everyday ways that war completely reconfigured social life, right? It was a natural background. And so for me, um, 
and what was what, what was the, li the liberal position also focused on progress and on putting all of this effort into the progress and development that was happening um not looking at the immense violence not only just like the actual violence of war but the violence of the humanitarian work as well right and my work has documented that um since 2003 as early as 2003 um so for me, um, it, it made it even it makes it even more difficult and problematic, right? So I, as a scholar of Afghanistan, as um, yeah, someone who's been invested in multiple ways and multiply situated, I um, while I'm immensely critical of non-Afghans, primarily white scholars and males who have written on Afghanistan, part of what Hanifi calls like the immense knowledge production that has actually been used to enact violence on the people of Afghanistan, right? Um, and while I'm critical and will always be um, I'm still critical of, of non-Afghan and white scholars uh, writing on Afghanistan, to be frank, not many Afghans were critically engaged with the war on terror and imperialism either, right? So I'm putting that there to complicate, right? How difficult it has been as an Afghan to critique the war on terror, then add the, the element that I'm Pashtun, because automatically critiquing the war on terror and imperialism means that you're a Taliban sympathizer, right? Um, the second um, thing I would like to add before um, I, I hand it off, because I just want to sort of lay, um, you know, the, the um, you know, some things we can talk about, right, is um, I also want to critique the left. So very, you know, and I'm going to make a very, really kind of ridiculous, clumsy comparison, but just like it's so easy to critique um, Donald Trump and those like right wing nutters for being racist and like blatantly racist. We ignore um, the liberal sort of Clinton Biden liberalism that is stunningly racist. Right. So when it comes to Afghanistan, and again, I'm making this like link to Palestine, you know, the, the book by Lamont Hill and Mitchell Plitton, Except Palestine, I do feel in many ways um, a lot of solidarity with uh, ways of thinking of Afghanistan. Everyone's progressive with everything except when it comes to Afghanistan. Right. So you can't take an anti imperial position or your aunt. So I'm what I'm trying to do is not only make a critique of the liberal position in Afghanistan, but the left. Because the left across the world stunningly failed Afghanistan, full stop. Right. And I've written about this in Jadalia with um, my comrades and and and, um, and um, co thinkers, Sadi Atur and Sahar al Ghamkhor, but just there's there's it's a stunning failure on the left to even try to understand what has happened in Afghanistan, almost radio silence over the last 20 years, right? So when, um, when I think about futurisms and want to engage with everyone here, not only in this um, few limited time that we have, but moving forward is what do we do about that, right? And I, I do think the Taliban um, and the Taliban is a formation coming out of serial war um, that's implicated in all the landscape of violence, right, has made it difficult um, in terms of the, the anti-imperial left doesn't know what to do with that, right? And um, I, I do think, um, yeah, I do think that uh, when we um, implicate liberalism, we, I can't leave out the left because um, they're basically uh, implicated in the liberal position because that's how, um, that's the position they assumed not only in the last 20 years, um, but maybe even more for Afghanistan. I'll leave it there and um, look forward to hearing from everyone and engaging more. Dr. Darlatzai, many, many thanks for th th this critical intervention, especially um, in regards to the last point also you made about the left in zones of accumulation and dispossession in the global South, as well as in the global North. and. Um, there has been so much that um, in, in, incredibly rich that you have been both like referring to, um, to bring both in a way the question to, to, to center stage 
the question of futurity through all these multiple narratives that you both have uh, opened for us and introduced to us. Um, maybe we can think about uh, futurity in the face of uh, war and in, the, uh, in war and in the face of political violence. So as students of Afghanistan across fields of research, who are invested in decolonization by way of imagining a different modality of subjectivity and alliance building, as well as of preserving and re uh, restoring non-human life, land, water, and air in Afghanistan, like literally when you cannot breathe, or as also uh, Shah Mahmoud also uh, Hanifi highlighted, uh, when there is no way to actually have some form of agriculture that is based on sustaining local economies, um, so while Afghanistan continues to be structured socially, economically, politically, and ideologically by imperialism, racism, and elitism that you both highlighted, or as well as serial war, to, to use a term coined by you, Dr. Anila, what, is, what possibilities do then colonial and liberal archives inhabit like can they be rethought repurposed in other words how do we as students of afghanistan who take decolonization seriously use our senses as well as listen to the silences of the archives as we work towards envisioning futurity and my other question would be there are manifold social political economic and epistemological obstacles that you both described in the struggle to decolonize knowledge production in and on Afghanistan in the present. So liberal feminists and women activists, including women of color and white women, dominate knowledge production and like white men. I mean, this is kind of across the spectrum, right? And also you highlighted how Afghans are, by the way of imperialism, interwoven as the reserve army of labor into these dynamics. Um, Professor Dowlet, uh, Dr. Dowlet, in the discursive occupation of Afghanistan, your article from 2008, you, you suggest a feminisms of possibility as the vantage point from which to think through grief, loss, and suffering as we try to think about pathways towards decolonization. In 2021, in a co-written piece for Al Jazeera with Sahar Gumkhor, you referred to Franz Fanon's notion of the else, elsewhere in the conclusion of the wretched of the earth and argue in Fanon's elsewhere, Afghans will discover not only a shared experience with other survivors of imperialism, but perhaps may embark on a process of identifying and articulating for themselves the ways humanitarianism and liberalism lie at the very core of the empire that currently starves them. Now, in contrast to people in Palestine or in Haiti, who also continue to be subjected to foreign military intervention, thousands of Afghans have been evacuated shortly before and since the takeover of Kabul by the Taliban in August 2021. Thousands continue to hope and or wait in desperate, under desperate circumstances in Afghanistan for admission to a capitalist democracy and do not want to attract negative attention. So those who like to express their anger, exactly responding to all of these incredibly important threats uh, and narratives that you have opened, um, do not do so explicitly as they do not know what might happen to their residence permits or application status, or if they express criticism of uh, members of the NATO who are simultaneously or potentially their guarantors of outward movement, right? Um, uh, Ustad Hanifi, you have used this very, very poignant term of like the ways in which movement is being frozen, I think you said. Um, so others who do not plan on leaving Afghanistan continue to work with the capitalist grammar, right? If we think of urban spaces, I'm, I'm marginalizing right now the rural, but please feel free to intervene in, the, uh, in that and further complicate it. So those who continue to live in Afghanistan, of course, and are kind of forced in a situation where they have to deploy a capitalist grammar and lexicon of foreign defense and development policies in pursuit of entrepreneurial opportunities or as they work within the neoliberal architecture of NGOs and international organizations that continue to prevail in Afghanistan, how can we 
bring also these dynamics into the discussion as we think about the impediments to futurity. Um, to just like complicate this, the, the, the gender question and the woman question comes also into play here. Many Afghan women activists transnationally continue to use the lexicon of the occupiers as they express their expectation of the international community, which is most like led by member states of the G7 or wider the G20. So in this scenario, how can decolonial, how can decolonization of feminisms of possibilities as well as archives work from bottom up to unlearn these grammars and lexica? especially in the era of digitalization? How can unlearning internalized imperialism, to use a term that uh, Sotanifi also used, and you, Dr. Anila, pedagogically and epistemologically look like? Uh, whoever likes to respond to this. Um, I, I will start, um, Penny's John, please don't mind, um, Hanifi Saab. Um, I, I will just I, I'll lay out um, a few, Things I appreciate you um, you looking at the uh, discursive occupation piece. Um, to, to be honest with you, that was a piece um, taking into account um, how long it takes for journals to publish a piece. That was it looked it, it, that was literally written twenty years ago, right? So if we put that you know in in the the constellation of that, it's still relevant. But I wrote that twenty years ago, right at 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 the outset of um, my ethnographic field work in Afghanistan and really trying to um, deal with the violence that was done through humanitarianism in the name of humanitarianism on quote, vulnerable um, populations, particularly widows, right? So, you know, I'm just, I'm, I'm trying to place it temporally, right? Not that I distance myself um, from the arguments I'm making there. Um, I distance myself from a lot, even things I've said last week. But um, one thing I will say, right, when you, use the feminism of possibility. I'm not sure I would use that. I'm pretty sure I would not use that right now, right? Um, so I'm gonna take up um, um, the quote that you um, uh, did from the piece I did with Sahar uh, um, um of the, the elsewhere, right? And, and I do like thinking about that. And, and again, it goes back to your stunning um, intro to um, this webinar and, and just ways of thinking um, of connecting um, and sort of an internationalism, right? Um, I, I would say um, a left internationalism, anti-imperial rooted, right? I would say um, before that work and right, and I'm really hesitant to say this because I myself as an ethnographer, um, I, um, I can tell you pretty frankly that in the past year, especially, but not only in the past year, when, and these are top critical journals um, in, in sort of the academic sphere have asked me to sort of narrate loss in Afghanistan, right? I've come to the point where I, I don't wanna do it. I refuse. I literally inhabit the, the refusal because the loss is there, right? And if you were sleeping or missed it in the 20 years, and now you just want like an Afghan to tell you how bad it was because there's some sort of currency in Afghan suffering and and um, Afghan, it's, it's almost like, I, I, I would wanna use the word maybe inappropriately, but it's almost pornographic, right? Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm holding myself back from having to be that narrator because it's been there all along. And if you're just waking up now, that's not on me and I'm not gonna do that labor, right? So I would have to say that this position that I'm articulating right now, I would have to say that it comes from anger. It does have to come from, you know, and I, and I can say um, that I have that privileged position to be able to voice that anger um, differently from the Afghans that you um, narrated in your question, the ones that have recently <clears throat> evacuated, one that have to perform the, 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 the gracious, gracious recipient of care, right? Th that can't be critical of the whole thing, can't be furious at how they're being treated in America and elsewhere, right? As once again, 
right? Like not even refugees yet, but once again, like evacuees, because evacuees is a legal category. You're not really yet a refugee, right? So for me, it's there, there's all these things that, that get mapped on and my answer is kind of all over the place. But I do want to say, um, given all that I've just said, right? In terms of thinking of an elsewhere, right? And building with um, sort of a left internationalism, I can't begin to do that as, as much as I've tried um, over decades. I can't begin to do that when I realize um, that the left itself has failed Afghanistan. And if I want to say, forget um, Afghanistan as a concept in a nation state, have failed Afghans, right? Like they have not attended and they have not used their labor intellectual um, in terms of solidarity in material ways to actually um, take seriously Afghanistan, right? So before this project of futurity um, for me, right, is imagined, right? Because I, I would think similar to Afrofuturism that's not in relation to whiteness, right? But it's in, embedded in its own um, integrity and, and um and resources, right? Um, a lot of more labor, intellectual and otherwise needs to be done, right? Because I don't want to skip where, you know, like for example, I'm, I'm gonna, um, I'm, I know I've been talking too long, but there's, there's, um, there's something that's going to be happening in in Berkeley. It's a it's an art exhibit and um, that's with scholars and and um, of Han artists. I'm not a part of it. I wasn't even asked <laughs> to be a part of it, which is fine, right? But it's called. Um, something like beyond the forever war or something like that. Okay, yes, I like the concept of like not having to always focus on suffering as I told you myself, I'm refusing, right? But at the same time, I do not think we're at the space to be beyond a war that nobody has dealt with, even Afghans themselves, right? And so until we look at the psychic landscapes, all the other landscapes critically, intellectually, right? You know, um, humanly, I, I don't, I, I myself have a hard time thinking, right? Like beyond um, Afghan bodies right now. And that might, again, be participating in another form of violence. But for me, I'm telling you where I've been, because I know so many Afghans, um, and others um, that are allies and in solidarity have done a lot of labor, particularly in the last um, um, 18 months, we're exhausted. But then um, I've been working on Afghanistan for three decades now, right? So I'm adding exhaustion upon exhaustion to say that um, maybe that's where this is coming from and I'm not maybe making too much sense right now, but I hope it's 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 hitting some points that um, we can begin to talk about. Yeah. Ustad, uh, Hanifi, would you like to respond also to that? I, I, I certainly will, and I will also do my best to be brief, cognizant of, of the time. Um, but I, I do want to make a few points regarding the Kind kind of repurposing of the um, colonial archive and neoliberal archive, um, and I'd like to do that again uh, as quickly as possible using a few images. And uh, the first thing I'd like to say about sort of uh, reading against the grain or moving beyond uh, established readings of the archive, either we need to sort of get serious about or get beyond this great man approach to Afghan history, where there's about five individuals, Ahmad Shah Durrani being coronated here via an image produced in the 1930s by a German trained artist, Brishna, whose visuality um, of all the uh, uh, rulers of Afghanistan, he's responsible for one man for the imaging of the historical personages that have driven Afghan history. And I, I just suggest that we really need to um, move beyond that uh, great man approach to history. We need to get critical of these people. The sort of positioning this man as unifying the Pashtun tribes and writing Pashtun, th there's very little spurious evidence of Pashtunness or Pashtun conduct in the historical record of this individual born in Multan raised in Iran, capital in Kandahar. And I just think so much more um, 
kind of critical analysis of the personages is important. The map itself needs to be deconstructed. This is an Afghan national map from the 1960s that's built upon American early uh, radar cartography of the country. And so the national map of Afghanistan internalizes the colonial map. And this is a sort of um, problem of independence that in 1919, Afghanistan apparently becomes independent and it's in charge of this space on its own terms now. But that independence needs to be unpacked because it actually produced far more dependencies that led really um, to the downfall of the country again, um, mainly the way national elites in Kabul navigated the outside world and its resources and influences and failed in doing so, in my view, largely. So um, I'd like to rethink the map. I'd like to think about counter mapping. I'd like to think about other um, ways of expressing spatiality. I'd like to see a people's map of Afghanistan where the emotional sort of relationship to space and the historical sort of spatiality of local communities uh, is highlighted. I'd like to see a people's art book of Afghanistan. There's just so much more to bring in um, the voices of Afghans who have been left out of the discourse of Afghanistan. The sort of celebration of national elites who are so interested in European modernity. Afghan independence is generally celebrated with Amanola and Soraya. And again, Amanola rearing the star of India and Soraya as well. I mean, this is crypto colonialism. This is the presentation of independence in a frame that's acceptable to the sort of international sense of what national identities and independence looks like. Crypto colonialism is a sort of framework um, developed by Michael Herzfeld that's enormously illuminating um, for Afghanistan. He designed it for Greece and Thailand, two kind of paracolonial locations. It's very useful. So I think more theorizing with crypto colonials and critiques of independence. This map, the ethnic map, no, nothing has done more damage to Afghanistan than the ethnic map. And where this map came from, came from how it was produced, the personalities, the institutions, the organizations that implement this map need to be critically analyzed. And this particular map um, is in large measure uh, a expression of the ethnic map of Afghanistan that was crafted by Louis Dupree. And Louis Dupree, another sort of very important person who needs critical analysis as a complex individual with academic productivity, but also intelligence provisioning. And the translator on the right was kind of paid with his life, Mohammed Alam, for being an interpreter and a translator for Louis Dupree, who becomes kind of not just an academic who writes the Bible for Afghanistan, but also kind of the godfather of the Mujahideen. And it's really important to look at the context that Dupree worked in, in Afghanistan, the American University field staff, and in the United States, his connections to universities, particularly Duke, where his archives are held. Some of his archives are at Duke. This is a visual um, that appeared at a Duke conference a few years ago I attended. And uh, again, the, the, the map can be retooled would be the way to uh, draw meaning from this kind of uh, Mujahideen map. Um, and I, I just think that there's much more to be done with the map itself. Now, finally, um, let me be very clear that Nancy Dupree and Louis Dupree represent two pinnacles of knowledge production from the perspective of empire. Nancy Dupree um, associated with the Afghanistan Center Kabul University, the sort of guardian of knowledge. Nancy Dupree has been positioned as the grandmother of Afghanistan. I'd like to reject that wholly. Nancy Dupree is not my grandmother. And the height of imperial arrogance is to sort of ingest the, the other and make a, a sort of fabricated genealogy, myth-making. And I, I just 
would like to be a bit more critical about the Afghans themselves. Uh, and it's not just Ahmad Shah and his identity. Abdurrahman is positioned as a kind of state maker and bureaucracy builder. He's a really historically proven to be ill, sick man, mentally, physically, incredibly violent. The carnage, the bloodshed, the Hazarajat, Nuristan, the Hilzai Rebellion. How many people were, were trampled by elephants, boiled in water, blinded and exiled by Abdurrahman? My family still lives with that pain. And we need to take the, from all of our rulers, Amanullah, Daoud, Karzai, Ghani, it's not just them. It's the network of resources and imperial sustenance that they represent. And again, this is kind of crypto-colonial uh, feature. And um, I think also moving forward, there is an archive that was made the last 20 years. It's an archive of death. And that archive is really difficult to get at mainly because of security classification regimes and the idea of covert warfare that's inherently unaccessible to the public. Dangerously anti-democratic, the growth of covert warfare, the budget for that, the inability for accountability for the crime spree, the monsoon of bombs, 20 years of criminality, accountability, truth reconciliation, the environmental destruction of war, depleted uranium in our groundwater, birth defects, humans, animals, burn pit toxicity, not for US veterans, but for Afghans who are still living with it. And so I think we need to do much more with the current archive and the historical archive. Critical, knowledge production with a political consciousness and political critique of that, those systems of knowledge. I'm sorry to take more time. Please do not apologize. Um, I, I would like to thank you both for actually allowing um, us to have these conversations and also rendering visible that in the neoliberal university often wants to constrain politics of emotion as if we are just automatized researchers who are not situated in a social, economic, political, and epistemological environment. Um, so I cannot put into words like how uh, how incredibly valuable all of these uh, insights that you both have been sharing with us and the questions in particular that you have been posing and the sites where we need to further interrogate, investigate and delve further deeper into past and present archives. I cannot thank you enough for actually um, rendering those visible. And I'm incredibly excited for future forums and exchanges that we can have around all of the rich conversations that you both have been mapping out for us. Um, it beautifully sets the stage for our wonderful visual artists uh, who work in and outside of Afghanistan because of the very history and present that you both just described um, and shared with us through your decades of research. So, Sadia John, Shamaya John, Mohsen John, you all three work with varieties of mediums and deploy analytical and archival art labor to make sense of the past and present of Afghanistan. You all have lived, studied, and worked in multiple spatial locations inside and or outside of Afghanistan. How has your experience of migration, displacement, return and or refuge as a result of war and political violence in Afghanistan and or the diaspora informed your access to art pedagogy, choice of genre and the themes of your artwork. 
Um, Sadia Jan, would you like maybe to, to start to share with us? Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, Salam, everybody. Uh, thank you so much, Manis, for this wonderful webinar. And everyone else, uh, amazing team and amazing panelists. I'm honored. So to answering the questions, I will be first uh, sharing my uh, screen. So. <laughs> Okay, so basically my work is based on Hazara Nation Archive and a personal history and, and a, a past time period, uh, investigation on uh, uh, informal archives and uh, in, a, in a migrating landscape and its dislocation and disperse around the world because the, the, the question of dislocation basically uh, raised with the study and investigation on the locations of these photographs as an archive. So as, as some were photographed in, in Pakistan, some photographed in Afghanistan, some in Iran, so they were kind of dispersed into different locations. Um, and the photographs that were taken in somewhere else are now in somewhere else and they're preserved in a, in a, in a way that, that, that is not so known to people. <clears throat> So the first work that I am presenting is from a familiar land. It is uh, a painting that has been developed in layers and like 30 to 40 layers in one uh, painting with, with this transfer technique, uh, technically, and with, uh, with different mediums like acrylics, inks, and pigments, and, and other drying materials. So this, uh, this uh, image is of a... Uh, group of women uh, photographed in a studio in Pakistan. And uh, uh, the best, the thing is that the kind of uh, interested me is that all of them has different story of displacement and migration. And uh, they were framed in one, in one single location. And it was one of this very magical time where they are together and, and they're staring uh, through a, to a time. So, so here's a close up of the paintings that I've kind of shared. So uh, the kind of patterns that I have used in my painting are, are these patterns that are from crafts, the barak or, or the peacocks that used to be uh, embroidered on the tapestries and kind of culture motifs that are even practiced today. So the point is that, uh, but uh, uh, the point is that I'm extended the idea of archive as not just a photograph, but many other things in archive, like the culture motive or, or, or the craft are also part of um, archive and how they are dislocated with the people. So uh, uh, the next uh, work is that our work is in the lane of unknowns. It is also technically developed in layers. And uh, there is this image that I've created. Some are, uh, some are from the original photograph reference that I have used, and some are kind of imagined and uh, uh, corrected that I have added myself and uh, rendered. So, uh, so basically the idea that, uh, I'm kind of reimagining, reimagining a past, uh, a, an archive that that uh, that a kind of storytelling to my visuals, and and the patterns that I've used are again, of, of course, from the same uh, same uh, embroideries and and how they are floating and giving the sense of transition, a sense of journey, e either beginning or or ending. And that's how, how archives are in a state, how, how these archives are in a state that they, are, they don't have a location, a permanent location of their own. Uh, as I said, those are imagined figures that I'm kind of adding and, and kind of building a story of my own. Okay, so this is uh, the third work. Share it, digeras, this is uh, uh, a line from 
Fariduddin Attar's poetry. Uh, and it kind of uh, reflects back on, on my personal journey and coming here to Lahore and studying from away from home and how I feel like foreign after even four years and trying to adjust, but still always, always foreign. And, and kind of corresponding, uh, correspondingly reflecting to, to, uh, to my nation and my community, always <laughs> transiting places, and how foreign, how foreign it might be to to like, be in someone else's land. So, um, so the kind of treatment in this painting is that the background of painting looks like an aging background where, where it, it shows an archive aging and and uh, and also kind of influence from mobile miniature uh, uh, color palette and, and the treatment and the foreground is is of this uh, floral motifs that kind of regrowing and and figures uh, reimagined and, and re-envisioned uh, and drawn in silhouettes and lines showing that how this is another like kind of story developing through through reimagining a past so uh so yeah and uh, and and the idea that uh, the idea of like working with this archives is that that uh and, and doing this this painting layers is that how I feel the archive I've achieved is through layers of land, time, and, and like people in this, in a, in a very migrating landscape where I didn't achieve everything exactly. You know, there's, there's a loss in between. And that's how the layers are developed that, that kind of also hides one layer, but also translucently uh, kind of shows the, the very initial layer. Uh, so the, the last work that I am presenting is Breath of a Stranger on a Familiar Land. This uh, a painting is also like kind of uh, developed in layers and uh, collaged with the different uh, photographs. And uh, so uh, the, the, the title came from this um, reflect, kind of reflects on this time when, when there was like when there still there is, and, and the time of the past when there was like a lot of uh, interference uh, from, from uh, on Hazarajat land and, and how you see this, this picture is of, uh, is, is, uh, shows the landscape of Hazarajat and, and, and the, the title kind of connects to the time when mm, it felt foreign in your own land, when there was so much of intervention and, and invasion of other forces and how it feels uh, like the, either the, also like the, the land is familiar, but the, the kind of air that you breathe is not familiar. And it's, it's strange. Uh, so yeah, uh, here it is. Uh, thank you so much. And, and I'm like further working more on, on fragments of archive and bringing it together through, through my paintings. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Sadia John. I have to say it is really precious to, to have learned about your work um, as a painter, as a woman painter. And like what you've just described is almost like visual poetry um, and how you actually render visible informal archives, right? Like what happens in war and in the face of political violence is like, where we need to maybe look for archives is actually in the homes, in the homes of the displaced. And I think your, your work beautifully takes us by the hand to actually re-envision historic historiography as well as uh, present political and social analysis by re-envisioning the past through the situatedness of the displaced. So um, a thousand thanks for sharing. Oh, thank you. Also, also looking, yeah, also looking back at the archives and, and a very visionary and creative past rather than just a politicized history. So I think that that is the main mission of coming with this work. Absolutely, like bringing aesthetics also from a situated yeah. perspective into the game. Absolutely. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Shamayajan, 
would you like to? Hello there, darling. Hi. Hello, everyone. The family. I have to say this, not to be redundant, but to have it be on the record that thank you so much, Penny's Jonah, Tashakur, that you've done this and you've put together this panel and that a wish of mine that I never knew would be a possibility where we're speaking in English and using words like capitalism that doesn't make people kind of get afraid. And we're talking about art and it just, it means so much to have this kind of discussion be happening. We don't get this kind of solidarity and I don't want to embarrass anyone, but I will say to Penny's John that you do exemplify some true allyship of an Iranian towards Afghans and you're a blueprint, to be honest. So I'm just very honored to be amongst my countrymen and countrywomen who say things like Nancy Dupree is not our grandmother, which is true. I highly, highly agree with that. So I would like to show a little bit about my work, but before I jump right into that, I will say a little biography there to make it concise is a little tough but um, I don't have formal art training at all, but I do have, I have had the privilege of education as Penny's John mentioned with my biography. Um, being in migration, homelessness, homecoming, returning, leaving, refugeehood, assimilation, all these things, I think are a core part of my work. They're a fundamental part of my work because they're a fundal part, fundamental part of me. Uh, art is incredibly personal. Not only can it be revolutionary and political, but it's also highly, highly personal. Um, and our lives are not just affected by what we make. We're not just talking about what we make. We're also affected through this by how we can make. And I hope to kind of address this in some of my um, showing of my art. So one of the main things that I hope before I show some art, just to make it clear, I strive very much so to not put my people, myself and my people in a situation for more oppression through my art. And that's a big responsibility. And sometimes your art gets misunderstood, but that is a big part of the backbone of my art, trying to make sure that there is dignity given to Afghans, which all of my comrades have mentioned that that's something lacking, uh, especially with the current lens on Afghanistan. And um, yeah, with all humbleness, I will begin showing you guys some of my work. Let's see if I can share the screen properly. I hope that, is it working? Uh, not yet. Not yet. Let's try again. Ah, oh, there you go. Oh no, it's working. We're still seeing. It. How does it appear in the online version? Maybe minimize the screen. Amanda saying what? Minimize the Zoom screen. Ah, oh, yeah. There you go. Got you. Okay. So these, uh, what I will show next is two slides of work that I am currently working on. So I will read a little bit about what I've written about it since it's a little heady. These are a series of museum placards uh, that I'm working on or art title cards. Uh, they're photographs of an installation piece. So it does look a little bizarre to be decontextualized and not in an installation capacity. Um, I hope to show you guys in the future. This consists of dozens and dozens of art title cards that of works that don't exist. So I'll show you a second and third one. This consists of dozens and dozens of uh, art title cards describing work that doesn't exist, forcing the audience to interact with moments of the past 20 years of Afghanistan. I hope it makes people have to confront some of the truths of the past 20 years forces to stop creating everything into perfect binaries, which is very colonial. Also for us to take in that time 
does not begin and end in Afghanistan with or without Taliban, with or without foreign interventionism. It's ongoing and we need to look at things in an ongoing way. Um, so Hanifi brought up a great point where if we're looking at the signatures of past emirs, that's just as important to understanding where we're at right now as critiquing the Taliban. It's part and parcel of it. Um, our history is ongoing and needs to be interacted with as such, and that's what I'm hoping to try and do with this. These things happened and we have to speak about it. Um, and the reason for this formatting that I've chosen is because I want audiences to have to imagine these moments themselves. And through that, they would be affording more humanity, both to the situation as well as to the Afghans depicted in the situation. I don't wanna overshare my work. So this is a little bit about this. Um, these are some images, both jewelry wise and clothing of my brand called Blingiston, which actually is the platform that allows me to make my other non-jewelry and clothing art. Um, in Penny's Jana's question about being a refugee and movement, one of the positivities that I've, I have seen personally, keeping in mind the privilege that I have to say this, of returning back to Kabul and being shown mediums that I never had access to in other parts of the world. For example, jewelry making and clothing. This was kind of the, the fact that I had access to a medium in Kabul that I wouldn't have had a medium, that medium accessible to me in Moscow or the US made me try to express myself through this medium I was unfamiliar with. And I think that's very powerful that through movements, I personally was able to see a, a medium I didn't think I had a possibility in ever trying with um, that ended up actually becoming my very much a part of my current life because this is now a brand that I own and I make this jewelry and clothing in hopes of connecting Afghans more to their identity and, and bringing up some, some questions as well. It's also turned into a platform of decolonizing and healing, which I'm very, very grateful for, both on the website and the social media components of it. Shamaya John? Yes. Sorry, can you, oh, we didn't see the, uh, the jewelry. It was still on the placard side. Oh, upsetting. Can you see it now? I've moved it on and off. It's, it's an image of Kabul John on, of the hills. Ah, there we go. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Yeah. It's always the Luddite that ends up doing technical <laughs> issues. <laughs> so here are some photos of Kabul that I am specifically showing to interrogate the concept of archiving. Who has a privilege of archiving? Who gets to archive? What is the process of archiving as an Afghan, as a migrant, as a refugee, et cetera? I unfortunately do not have access to either the prints or the negatives of these two photos that I myself took because of the corruption of our past governments and the foreign meddlement that made me lose my family home and all of my archived work from 2015 prior. So my portfolio of art is directly affected by the invasions, wars, and et cetera, that has been happening in Afghanistan. And I'm not the only person that has these kind of stories, I'm sure of, you know? But it, it does bring to mind, if we're in a constant state of flux, who is archiving and who has the privilege to archive? Something that I like to take time for in my work is to be a little bit playful because Afghans are very, very artful people. Art is part of our life. Art is part of our resilience. It's a part of everyday life. And the true essence of our art is accessible to all of our people. We may be an 80% plus agrarian country, but our art is disseminated in a way that the true essence can be accessible to everyone. And I try and honor that in some ways with some of my playful kind of photographs and multimedia uh, works like these two. Now for <laughs> the series of paintings that I, I did genuinely find to be the hardest that I would speak about um, because of the 
conversation that it opens and how it can be hijacked and misunderstood. We've already discussed liberal white feminism, et cetera, et cetera, the empire's narrative and not threatening the status quo. I wanted to work on a series of large scale canvases, which this is one, if you can recognize the balloon, <laughs> hopefully the people who know, know. I wanted to focus on examining something that's part of my lived reality and the lived reality of many women that I know, which is the hypo-sexualization of Afghan women and the hyper-sexualization of Afghan women that happens simultaneously. If wars have been justified off of the backs of what we're wearing, so too is this part of our day-to-day -day life. So what was interesting while putting these slides together for me personally was that I, I and in conversation with Penny's, John decided to actually take some, pull some images because when one shows nudity in a space, when one shows these subjects, it's very easy for it to be hijacked in any direction and misunderstood. And again, like I mentioned, I don't want to participate in creative, creating narratives or perpetuating narratives that hurts my people. Um, but we, if we want to talk about all the details of what life was really like and all the intersectionality and positionality and, and let everyone speak their true stories, we're going to have to confront these things while also having to keep in mind that we can't let it be hijacked. Uh, our stories cannot be hijacked. And so this is ongoing. It started uh, many years ago. This kind of ask who, who is more oppressed. It's, it's naive, it's innocent. I, I was in my early twenties. I'm trying to figure out for myself, for the world, who is more oppressed? Am I more oppressed when I'm completely covered? Am I more oppressed? on the other end of it, it's not, I, I think I have the answer to this, this now, eight years later, but these are the kind of conversations that I am trying to have through self portraits and through large scale acrylic canvas based work. Um, and I think that about wraps it up for my, uh, discussing my art. Thank you so much for listening and I'll pass on the mic. Um, Mohsen John, thank you for all your patience. Monsieur Tashakor, very separate. Um, so I would give now the mic to Shafak to kind of, uh, yeah, and you to um, introduce us to your incredible work. And it's just a really great pleasure to have um, to have you here. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> ببخشید از لحاظ دیگه و دیگه این تجربه میشه قبلا من یک جای دیگه یک پرزنتیشن بدم نفر اصلا میشه آخر گفتم گفتم برو خیر ان شاء الله که تحمل میکنه صحبت ها اینا دیگه اسلاید خود شما بگذارید یا من بوکس شروع کنم Uh, do we have the slides ready? Oh, 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 من بیشتر روی تجربه شخصی خود و تجربه روند تجربه آموزش یا روند یادگیری هنر و دلیلی چرا جان یا چه سبک یا چه رویش کار ما مهم رست سلام دو یه رو می؟ یه Uh, Mohsen says that uh, he wants to go straight to uh, explaining his artworks and uh, uh, talking about his personal experience uh, throughout uh, his uh, artworks and the methods that he is uh, using. Okay, I'm going to talk about the French language and I'm going to talk about it very well. 
به خاطر که یاد ما هست و یاد این مسئله مهاجرت، مسئله جابجایی، خشونت، جنگ تنها مسئله این روز نیست یعنی داستان های هست پر پر و از های ما تجربه کرده این مسئله را Today I am speaking from France and retrospectively I see that uh, violence, displacement uh, is something that has been ongoing and uh, as I have experienced this, uh, so has uh, my, my father, my, uh, my parents and people older than me. دمی چند سالی که ما در بخش اونه کار کردیم و تاریخ افغانستان رو وقتی میبینیم و کار کردیم و دیدیم و تجربه کردیم خب شاید برای همه جالب باشه و خیلی من احساس میکنم متفاوت هست برای یک هنرمند بودن برای یک آدمی که در سرزمین افغانستان بخواه کار هنری انجام بده uh, Looking at the history of Afghanistan as an artist it it is very different uh, experience mohsen bebash mesha ke nokte akhir ek bar digam tekrar kon yani tajrube khayli bare man mutafawit ta bare in ke dar sarzamin min safghanistan be inwan ek hunarmand boshi masalan As an artist, uh, doing artwork in Afghanistan, it has been a very different experience for me. Since I remember myself, I have experienced, I have touched, I have sensed, I have uh, seen violence uh, in all uh, spheres of my, my life. As I start, I uh, was not realizing uh, that uh, what way I am uh, advancing to, uh, what would be the outcome. I was just experiencing uh, uh, as a quest for beauty. Uh, uh, I was approaching uh, my works as a uh, uh, as a quest for beauty and uh, I did not foresee what would come out of my works. قوم خون یا مثلا زبانی چیزا مطرح نیست در ذات خود هنر و به عنوان یک هنرمند نباید روی این مسئله تاکید باشه یعنی نباید تاکید مکردن یا مکرد در واقع I have lived in Afghanistan as a Hazara citizen and uh, although in the core of artwork uh, ethnicity race shouldn't be uh, a concern but uh, I have been uh, lived uh, uh, as a Hazara artist in, in Afghanistan. Afghanistan. It might be interesting for others to see how different is uh, being a Hazara artist in contrast to um, anyone else. Uh, 
in Afghanistan, living humanly is difficult for everyone. And it is even more difficult for uh, Hazara. خب یک مسئله تاریخی که از روز که مثلا نام افغانستان تغییر کرده یا یا مثلا از تاریخی که مشخص اگه بگیم از تاریخ بنام افغانستان شروع شده یک مسئله هست یک مسئله فعلی 20 سال گذشته هست که ما تجربه کردیم so he and Mohsin discussed two points. One is uh, the history of Afghanistan, the fabrication, the forgery, uh, and the name itself. And the second uh, point that he wants to discuss is uh, uh, the life in the past 20 years. <laughs> چرا به عنوان انسان و چرا تفا... همیشه باید مورد فشتار قرار بگیره و مورد قتل عام قرار بگیره و این من مجبور کرد که تاریخ افغانستان رو مطالعه کنم افغانستان که چرا دلیل چرا من چرا چرا با دیگران نمیتونم در یک جامعه مثل افغانستان زندگی کنم جدا از مسئله لیبل هنرمند بودن فقط به عنوان یک هزار هم این 2010 هی uh, Uh, what is sparked uh, uh, interesting to me was to uh, to find out how uh, and why coexistence with others is difficult in Afghanistan, and that's um, that led me to examine the history of Afghanistan. <laughs> متوجه شوم که آه ما به عنوان یک هزاره در طول تاریخ مخصوصا از دوره عبدالرحمن این دوران را گذراندم و تجربه کردم حالا به عنوان یک هزاره به عنوان یک هنرمند وظیفه میدنم خالی یا مثلا رسالتی من چی هست دقیقا من چی کار باید بکنم چی میتونم بکنم uh... Through studying the history of Afghanistan, I realized uh, the uh, heritage, the Hazara heritage, and and I uh, thought, what would be my role, my duty, my mission as an artist? As a matter of bar hold the physicality, bar hold the ma ben one again, son is in day hazard. Chashmdir bissalima. چی در ابعاد مثلا تعصبات اداری چی در مثلا سیاسی چی در فرهنگی نابودسازی مثلا بودای بامیان نابودسازی آثار باستانی و همه اینا باعث میشد که من مجبور شم که چی نو کار چی نو اگر هنر به عنوان صلاح فکر کنین چی نو کار باید داشته باشه یا ژانر میاد سبک میاد رویشم چی باشه دقیقا experiencing physical violence and uh, many instances of real and perceived uh, uh, discrimination uh, say when looking um, when dealing with uh, the bureaucracy of the afghanistan government and uh, in other spaces i uh, and for example uh, seeing um, uh, knowing the destruction of Buddhas of Bamiyan, I started to think uh, what, what genre of art uh, is fit for my works. And if we consider art as a voice, uh, how my voice uh, would look like, should look like. As a result, I و با همین باعث میشد که در افغانستان لیبل مثلا خود به عنوان هنرمند متعصب حتی در فضای آکادمی در دانشگاه در هنر حتی هنرمندای مثلا افغانستان به من میگفت که چرا به خاطر مثلا کارهای تو سیاسی و مخصوصا برای هزاره ها کار میکنی این برم جالب بود بیکاز دی نیچر اف مای آرت ورکس از پولیتیکل آی واز 
labeled. I uh, I faced questions from people uh, in the university and also out of the university that why your focus is on Hazara ethnicity, why your artworks uh, is uh, centered on Hazaras. <laughs> مجموعه شروع کردم و به نام تولد دوباره سرخ یا The Rebirth of the Reds که مشخصا بعد از حادثه بهمزنگ در کابل یا جنبش روشنایی در کابل بود که تصویرهای نقاشی رو که میبینی از همون مجموعه و ما مشخصا جدی روی از مجموعه کار کردم After the, uh... Developments in 2013, uh, I started working on uh, my series called The Rebirth of the Raid. And the Junbishi Roshnayi explosion uh, has driven my uh, work, my uh, artwork, uh, The Rebirth of the Raid, afterwards. <laughs> موضوعی بود که به عنوان مثلا یک انسان در افغانستان چه کار میتونه با هنرمند و از یک طرف دیگه مستندسازی که ما پیش از صحبت کردیم هم موضوع یک و مستندسازی یا داکومنتیشن تاریخ است برای ما خیلی مهم بود I uh, through this rebirth of the raid I was following two aims two goals one was uh, to uh, express my my views my own views uh, and the second was to contribute to the documentation to archiving of the um, things that was happening in Afghanistan wa hamin tor ami naqashiya dar tuli muddati chand sal idama dasht ta ki mad dar faransa am amadu hatta dar kabul am az shakhsiyat hay naqashiya sarkh به عنوان یک اجرا یا پرفارمنس در اول در کابل 2019 انجام دادون و بعدش هم در ماخسه و یک اجرا در ماخسه بود که ادامه داشت همین موضوع So I continued uh, the rebirth of the raid uh, series uh, we had uh, performances in, in Kabul and also in, in France و هنوز هم همین مسئله مهاجرت همین مسئله خشونت یا مثلا همین جنگ همین چون در اینجا وقتی میاییم خیلی سوال برای ما مخاطبین از ما سوال میکنه که وقتی از افغانستان هستی خب طبیعی یک آدم در یک فضای جدید میره تغییر میکنه کارش یا مرویشش یا تکنیکش یا موضعش اما او ریشه ای که ما 20 سال در نسل به نسل در خیر کرده بود یا گذشته بود هنوز هست این تجربه رو ما نتونستیم هنوز بخاطر که ممکن بعد از ما هم ممکن بعد نسل آینده با این برخورد کنه با این تجربه جابجایی خشونت جنگ ماجرا the interrelated experiences of uh, violence war and uh, uh, displacement uh, immigration uh, has been recurring uh, and in in france i am facing the Um, questions from from the public uh, uh, and uh, one of the importance of this uh, artwork might be to uh, um, to give a picture that it has been recurring and it might uh, recur it might uh, happen again in the future <laughs> کار میکردیم زندگی میکردیم یا کار میکردیم همیشه دنبال یک افغانستان خیالی بودیم یک سرزمین خیالی بودیم که احساس میکنیم مربوط این جا اینجا نیست ما نمیدانم و همو حس دوباره در این ای طرف مرس های اینجا که زندگی میکنیم ما هست یعنی هم اونجا دنبال یک فضای خیالی بودیم که هر ما مطمئنم هر انسان افغانستانی همین تخیل یا هم فکر هست که دنبالش باشه که اگر فانسان خیالی داشته باشه What was interesting to me was uh, both inside of Afghanistan and uh, now outside of Afghanistan uh, 
uh, I was looking, uh, I was uh, thinking of an uh, imaginary and ideal Afghanistan, and it has, it is something that uh, uh, that I have seen in myself and others. موجود بیست سال این کشور ها مرد هیچ تغییر نیامد مثلا هیچ همه همه چیز می انگار احساس میکنی که همون تاریخ 100 سال 200 سال پیش وقتی میخوانی درباره تو به عنوان یک شهروند شرقی از دید غربی همین فکر میکنه هیچ هیچ تفاوت ایجاد نشده در این 20 سال و دوباره برگشتیم بعد حتی برگشت از 2001 تا 0 The, the past 20 years uh, has changed uh, almost nothing uh, in how uh, in how uh, we are seen in how uh, um ببخش محسن نکته آخر خود میشه یک بار دیگه تکرار کنی من انظاری بجای اول و هیچ تفاوت اینجا نشد از دیده غربی ما همانه هستیم چه در این جامعه مثلا مثل اروپا ما زندگی میکنیم و حتی در افغانستان هم همین هیچ فرقی نشده هیچ فرقی ایجاد نشده یه خلق یه دنیای جدیدی با وجود نیامد که ما دنبالش نگردیم و افغانستان مورد نظر خود باشیم یا سرزمین شادی so. The past 20 years uh, couldn't change anything in our lives. And uh, we are seen like the people uh, uh, living 200 years back in the history. And uh, we are in no sense close to uh, the ideals that uh, we have in our mind uh, and imagined Afghanistan, uh, which is different from the reality. و فکر میکنم همین ادامه داره و هی این سناریوی مثلا جنگ خشونت تا هر وقت ادامه داشته باشه و میبینیم کارهای همه هنرمندای افغانستانی همی همی هم موازی پیش میره هم کار هنری یا تولید هنر در برابر خشونت جنگ و هر روش سیاسی so, as the violence is recurring uh, the war and displacement is recurring the artworks of our artists are uh, uh, impacted and they just reflect what's uh, uh, going on in Afghanistan. They are uh, like a uh, parallel, they are just the reflection of uh, what's going and they are, uh, uh, the nature of the artworks are political and uh, they reflect violence, war and displacement. I'm in the film. John, really thank you for sharing also the art spaces in which you have been practicing and like the spatial dimension of your work is just incredibly valuable as you're engaging in depth with actually living with the dead you are occupying the spaces of the living. Niaz, do you want to in us? No? Do you want to Okay. And this interplay of not basically continuing this narrative of being the living dead, but living with the dead, commemorating them, but also thinking about what it entails to live surrounded and entrenched with all these violences is um, in so many rich ways, like uh, manifest in so many rich ways in your work. Um, and it has been really a great pleasure to also like Mohsen was my one of my first interviewees and the one who um, introduced me especially to visual art places in Lahore as well as in Kabul since 2015-16. So um, it is incredible to see also your journey and the ways in which uh, your work has continued to think about the question of uh, life and art labor 
in the context of incredible violence. Um, we are almost at the end of the event, but I would like to give space if it is okay for questions from uh, among the panelists, as well as we have uh, one question from uh, the audience that we could address. So we would be like five minutes, seven minutes, and then uh, conclude with a lot of questions to take with us, um, if that is okay. So I would, um, among the panelists, would you like to address um, one of your fellow panelists' uh, thoughts and interventions? I, I just want to say um, how wonderful and important um, it has been to have this opportunity to display the work of these artists, Panis, it, it sort of continuing applause and my admiration to each of the, the artists here. Um, I also must say uh, with uh, Professor Dauladzai's observation about the failure of the left, I've just for regarding Afghanistan, I just find that so important. Um, but only to pick up on one of the visuals out of so many rich and just 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 wonderful uh, material. Um, the image of the uh, was it Shamael who had the uh, artist with the, with the blimp uh, on one of the first slides, I believe. Yes, it was Shamael. The uh, image of the blimp um, that you present from your experiences in Kabul, where for years the skyline was covered with those blimps, as well as throughout Eastern Afghanistan. And those blimps um, are not, of course, drones are armed. The blimps were typically not armed. They were just collecting information and surveilling. Digital information, photographic information, sensory information. That data, 10 years of surveillance nonstop, I don't know how many years those blimps were in the air. They started in about 2010, and I think till about 2015, please correct me. But where is that data? Who was using it and how? When will it be made available to the public? And all of the data, satellite, drone, blimp, all kinds of distant radar and surveillance, all of that data, um, needs to be accessible. And I just want to just applaud the reference to the blimp, uh, so painful, so painful. I really appreciate the acknowledgement because I, I worry sometimes that it, is it being seen? The title is a working title, The Balloon Saw You, because, you know, it was our everyday life, there was just something hovering in the air watching us at all times. And what, what did happen to the data? Excellent points, thank you, thank you. I was told also that at least for certain uh, privileged you know, UN um, elites, they could actually dial in to the camera on the blimp and spend their evenings looking up through the blimp's eye. I, 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 I find that intrusive and frightening and criminal. But it's not surprising, unfortunately. I have not Far heard this Imperial before. <laughs> Haven't heard this before, but why wouldn't someone who's probably not an Afghan have that kind of access to the blimp that went over our heads? Yeah. Not surprising. Yeah. No, I, I completely agree with Shamael Jones' um, assessment. Yeah, I, I didn't, I've never heard of that, Hanif Yusab, but at the same time, they had so much more access than Afghans did to Afghanistan right? Why not to um, the surveilling, right? They went to restaurants Afghans weren't allowed to eat in, right? They went to, I mean, so I, I would, um, that's just another way to um, sort of a pornographic lens of um, Afghanistan and an erasure of the violence their own work was doing, right? So um, how, to, how to simultaneously, um, yeah, that, that's, that's just, I could see that as a hip cool thing that, um, people um, would do in Kabul. So I, I haven't heard of that, but I am just completely not surprised. As a, as a, as a 
uh, uh, would, would anyone else like to respond to this or address to another uh, aspect that was mentioned? I hope that we will have more opportunities to go back to all of the incredibly rich conversations that you mapped out for us to think about and think through and continue to discuss. Um, it, it, there has been um, one question about what from the uh, audience, um, what do you make of creating a digital uh, archive of art for Afghanistan? creating a digital representation of our whole artistic heritage, which is unfortunately spread all around the world and the museums of the global north, making it accessible to everyone and also for future generations, chances for funding this project. Greetings from Berlin. And uh, another one, uh, what is uh, another person is, also, yeah, let's first maybe like um, allow Sh Shamayel to respond to this. I actually wasn't going to respond to that. I just wanted to say as uh, something to drop off. I had wanted to specifically address this uh, as a, in terms of Afghan womanhood, Afghan, Afghan artist womanhood, but I think we could look at it intersectionally and positionality we can swap things, it doesn't matter. But I just want to, because we have this space and it's been, a, it means a lot to all of us, I think, that we're able to discuss this here amongst each other. This is not common. This is incredibly not common. And we have to remember that both in academia and in art, us as Afghans, no matter what we're talking about, will constantly be silenced. If you want to call yourself Afghanistani, I also respect that. I, I just say Afghan as a colloquialism in English, but Afghanistani, Afghan, if you are making art, you are making you are knowledge, making knowledge production in any way, academia, art, it doesn't matter, any kind of revolutionary decolonizing activities, if you are talking in a way that threatens the status quo, if it does not push the empire's narrative, you will be silenced and censored. And I'm nobody and I have plenty of years of experience of this. So what happens to the other voices who are silenced and censored just because what we're talking about, our truth in whatever medium we show it. And I just want everyone to remember that. I wanted to go into the womanhood aspect of it. You know, what is it like to be showing your work, making money off of your work, and also your mother is happy and proud and not worried? That's a different subject that hopefully we will discuss at another point, but just Afghan, Afghans creating knowledge, knowledge production, creating art, keeping art, making art. Um, we saw what happened to the Kabul art scene in the past 20 years, and it was a shame and an embarrassment and we know why it happened. So let's try and learn from our mistakes and keep pushing against the status quo while knowing that we will be silenced and censored. Thank you, Shamaya John. Is it okay if I quickly respond to the digital archive question and like whoever likes to compliment, please inter, inter like interrupt me? Is that okay? So, so there is the work of, uh, in, in Germany, for instance, the AVA Collective, the work of Mohsen Tasha and uh, Shamail Shalizi, uh, you'll find the work actually on a number of websites. There's no, like, I mean, the question of the museum or an online museum raises a whole other set of question right around who governs then this museum. At the moment, it's very spread and it's multiple, it's very plural, even within uh, the digital. Um, but please feel free to, to search for the names of the artists. And uh, also you find um, on uh, Instagram, for instance, uh, Sadia's work. Um, she has been posting her beautiful uh, graduation show. Um, I hope this as chances for funding is also a very complex question because basically what has happened in the last 20 years in Afghanistan was that only particular forms of art were being funded and rendered visible and circulated in the digital. So 
at the moment also artists independently try to circulate their work, of course, or in cooperation with institutions. So the question would be, what kind of digital archive would the future hold? But definitely look into the work of Ava and also Google our wonderful artists for, um, for getting a better idea of the ways in which their work manifests in uh, the digital space. Um, there is someone who wants to ask a question about photography. Please just send your question. Of course you can ask. And another audience question, um, could you share any links of the work you have all been a, a breath of uh, fresh air after a long 18 months of repeated cycles and conversations, analysis and indignity towards Afghanistan. So thank you to the panel. Um, again, like, do look up like Sadia, uh, Shamayel, as well as Mohsen Tasha on Instagram. And uh, if you Google their names, you will find access to different institutions and organizations um, offering access to some of their work in digital spaces. I hope that helps. Um, last question. Could the speakers share any links to their, oh no, sorry, that was it. <laughs> I already read that. There are no more questions, right? Okay, so um, would anyone like to add to that? Um, I'm sorry, uh, Penny's John, I'm, I'm hesitant to add only because I'm a little bit confused about time. Do we have time? Um, I would say like you have the last word if it is uh, if that makes sense. Oh no, I don't. I don't ever. Yeah, that, that's we're noble. ten minutes over. We're ten okay. minutes over. Yeah. I'm sorry for that, but it would be beautiful if you if you would please go ahead. You have the last word. No, I I I simply had so much more to um, say and, and contribute to the artist. So I just hope all of us can can be in touch and build. Um, other spaces, inshallah, like the one that Paniz and um, her colleagues at Duke have made here, right? Two hours is certainly not enough um, um, to cover sorts of things for non-specialists, but then for those who are invested differently, right? And situated differently. And we have deeper um, 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 ways of wanting to build. I hope we can continue um, these conversations in, in smaller spaces and um, make more um, spaces like this, because I'll, I'll reiterate that in my more than 20 plus years of doing panels and webinars, I've never been um, so animated and, and, um, and stunned by um, the, um, the call that Panijan brought us here and ways that we can continue to think of what um, Afghan futurism would mean and look like and the kinds of work we have to do on ourselves um, and um, ways we can uh, encourage allies um, in as scholars, um, as activists and, and, and elsewhere to um, do the work that, you know, literally as, as so many of us ha have said, uh, has not been done right. So uh, when I think about you know the idea of abolish, right, and when I think about um, uh, contemporary politics in America of abolish the police and abolish systems, right, of of oppression, and I'm linking it again to the to um, uh, um, struggles of of black people in America, right, is um, it's so many people that are critics of abolition focus on the abolish part and don't focus on the building. Right. And so the imagination that's going to be required. So I'm I'm just really impressed by the, the artists here because they have been um, our imagination all along. Right. And will continue to be. And it's that imagination that um, is going to be needed um, a thousandfold for us to do that work, all the different kinds of work toward an Afghan futurism. Tasha Korbisyarzion. Ustad, Anila, um, nothing else to add to that. Thank you so much for this incredibly beautiful um, wish for the future for, for en envisioning, imagining, and also really mapping, mapping putting out there um, these wonderful visual artists, as well as the epistemological and political work that um, 
you, Ustad Anila Daulat Zai, and Ustad Shah Mahmoud Hanifi have been doing over the last decades, and on which, like, we are basing and also celebrating today, of course, with a heavy heart, but also celebrating the incredible intellectual and artistic work that all of you have been doing um, and the labor that you have been continuously investing um, despite all odds. So also a big thank you to all of you. Um, I cannot wait for us uh, together again and you know, continuing to ask all these important questions around how the question of future, question of futurity, as well as in a way the quest for futurity. Dere manana, besyor tashakor bosapos. A very warm thank you, and um, be healthy, good, safe. Thank you for your time and attention and participation. Dere manana, thank you so much. Assalamualaikum. Thank you so much.